That's what I just, I just turned on. Yeah, I, I think it's on silence, but the one time you think it is, it is. Been there. Oh, no, there. Actually, I was in a town council meeting. I got a call. The police had gotten to go on. I left the car. And he snuck out the sunroof. Oh, <laughs> so they have to take a one shot. I said, thank you. My wife was Welcome, everyone, to the Scarborough Town Council Wednesday night meeting. We have a workshop with the library trustees and our librarian. And why don't we just start so that we sort of know each other's names. We're going to start here. Let's just go around and introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Betty Perry. Hi, I'm Peter Hayes. I'm on the town council. Mary Alston Dow, trustee. Delon Rado, trustee. And Janik, trustee and president currently. Thank you. Ginny Ketch, trustee and secretary. Dan Doherty, trustee. Uh, Jim Cupel, trustee. Emily Ward, trustee. Peter Hatem, and vice president. Emily Reed, trustee. Uh, Will Rowan, town council. Tom Hall, town manager. Sean Baybine. Katie Foley, town council. Colonel, Colonel Adams, trustee. Jean Marie Katarina, town council. And Bill Donovan, town council. So why don't we turn it over to Nancy Kroll, the Scarborough Town librarian, uh, who can lead us forward with our discussion. Be delighted, and I want to point out that Mr. Baybine did not introduce himself as either a counselor or a library board member. He is um, both, so thank you for your Thanks. service, Sean, on our board as well. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight, and I, I hope I'm um, projecting appropriately in the microphone. It's a little hard to know what, what's uh, going out over the airways, but uh, I do have a PowerPoint presentation, but I'll be presenting with lots of hand gestures. And if you need a copy of the uh, presentation following the meeting, we can certainly make it available to you for posting on Google or, or any of your other drives that, that's appropriate. And at the end of the program tonight, we do also have some handouts for you that will talk more about some of the services that I'm touching on, as well as a copy of our latest newsletter. For those of you who aren't on our list, I hope you all are, but in case you're not, we do have uh, our, our monthly newsletter available for you tonight as well. So I will get started. This is an unfamiliar laptop, so I, I'm sure I'm going to be um, stellar at operating it, but just in case I'm not, please <laughs> So the title is very deliberate uh, for the presentation. It's for, from Collections to Connections, and that is intending to point out the fact that libraries are no longer warehouses for things. They are places where people connect with one another and information. So the days, um, you all know by now that I've been at the library a very long time. And when I first started, it was all about collections. It was about grabbing every book we could get our hands on and putting it on a shelf somewhere. That is long gone. Uh, it's an entirely new concept and a new way of operating. And uh, I think a pleasurable one and one that works much better for the full community. So with pleasure, I'm here to tell you that your public library is about connections. So I'm going to cover a variety of things tonight. I'm going to do a quick overview of the organizational structure just so we are all on the same page. I'm going to review briefly the strategic plan that we are very much engaged in right now and we'll talk more about where we are in that process. I'm going to talk about the uh, current information that we're starting to gather and at, at that point I'll be turning it over to Jim Cupel who has been working with us on our survey instrument and gathering the, the data for us. I'm going to go back then to our strategic priorities, which are really important to us in terms of what we've been operating under. And I will touch on our EVPV. And I'll talk briefly about the plans for the future. And I do mean briefly because that's an opportunity for us to have a conversation. So our organization, as you know, is a nonprofit 501c3 corporation. It is managed policy making management by the 14 member board of trustees. One of those 14 people is an appointee from your town council, and one of them is a representative of the Friends of the Library, which is itself a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. So of our 14, two members are from outside agencies. They are all fully voting members. So this is not an ex officio without voting rights. It is ex officio with voting rights. The building is co-owned by the town. Our bylaws are set up so that if the library corporation ever ceases to exist, 
the assets of the corporation will revert to the town of Scarborough, and Scarborough has the opportunity to determine what the disposition of those assets is. We are on town property. We have leased the property in advance for 99 years. When we built the building that we are currently in, which we still refer to more than 25 years later as the new library, uh, it was a 99-year check, $99 right up front. So we are on town property officially at this point. We are supported primarily by the town of Scarborough operating budget. We have, uh, this past year, 92% of our budget is from the town's municipal appropriation. We operate as if we were a town department, so I function as a department head. <coughs> I am presenting budgets to you as a town council. I also have the library board's finance committee in the background as well. So I go through a number of steps. I create a budget. The finance committee has authority over it at the board level. The board passes it present it to the town manager who presents it to the council finance committee and then the full council. So you can see that there are a lot of fingers touching that whole process. Uh, so hopefully it's been vetted fully by the time you as council have a chance to look at it. We have additional revenue from fines, rentals of the meeting room. We do have a small amount of bank interest and then we do have a, an investment portfolio which is modest but it does allow us to add uh, a couple, uh, we're at twenty to $25,000 right now in interest that we've been able to draw each year. And that was important to us to offset the increases in costs for operations of the library. We also have an annual fund each year and that is uh, a fund that we increased the goal for this past year, $50,000. We were successful in meeting the $50,000 goal and we um, have made $50,000 our goal for this coming year as well. We don't know what the impact of the new tax laws are going to be in terms of charitable giving, mm -hmm. so we'll be watching the personal deduction issues with some interest over this next year. The uh, Friends of the Library are also significant donors. As you know, they operate a Friends of the Library book sale once a year. We don't know exactly when that's going to occur this year because with the school calendar, oh. the high school hasn't released its space yet. So we are um, fingers crossed uh, that we will be having it at, at approximately the same time in June. But please pay, pay, uh, stay tuned. We're going to have the date out just as soon as we possibly can get it out. The Friends of the Library uh, do a phenomenal job and have one of the best book sales in the state because it's very well organized and um, they work really hard on sorting all year long. They raise money for some of our collection support, but they also are primarily responsible for the summer reading program for the kids, and that is a big contribution to us. Uh, we also have grants and bequests from time to time. We don't typically put those in an operating budget because we just don't know what they're going to be, but we're all, also great at what we call opportunities. If we see an opportunity for a grant that makes sense, we'll certainly be out there and try to apply for it. And then we do have bequests. Obviously, those are difficult to plan. But we do also have a new opportunity for folks who have included the library in their estate plan to come forward and identify themselves so that we can give them recognition prior to their passing. And that's the 1899 Society. We have a plaque in the library near the front desk where we've identified those folks who have been willing to step forward and identify their potential gift in the future. And uh, we encourage anybody in the community who would like to work on estate planning and leave the library something in their plans to please check in with us and we'll give them the appropriate information. So it is a big help to us. I was trying to come up with a way of uh, determining a return on investment, <coughs> the ROI of the library. And one of the strategies I used was turning to what's called the value use calculator at the, at the state library. It is a list of services and collections within the library that you can put a dollar value on. So a meeting room might have a typical rental rate of $60 an hour if you go out into the commercial market. Your book might have an $18 value if you had to buy it from Amazon. You can plug in your family's use of the library into that calculator and come up with what's the library done for you this year based on the value of the services you've utilized. So I took the town circulation. I figured out from the fiscal year 2017 what all of the activity from the town has been in these various categories, came up with the final number, and for the gross expenditure of 1.165, the result was almost $4 million in value in one year to the town of Scarborough. So I hope you'll agree with me that that's a pretty good value. 
And that doesn't include the intangibles, the, the things like people getting together, people stopping in and reading the newspaper, uh, meetings that might be occurring, um, after school care, uh, things that we are special for, the heart that we provide to the community isn't something we put price on. So that isn't in that $4 million, but the actual day-to-day -day transactions that we've been able to count um, are included in that 30, 39 million, 3.9 million figure. So I thought that that was helpful to get a scope of what we, pro what we provide to our citizens. The strategic plan that we have worked on uh, is dated 2017 through 2019, so you can see we're on the edge of starting another cycle. When we met with you as in a workshop <coughs> setting several years ago, we were at the beginning of this planning process, and we were meeting with the town council as part of one of our focus groups. So you were at the beginning of this whole process, and this is the outcome. As part of that whole strategic planning process, we did SWOT analysis, we did community scan and constituent, site and constituent identity, and that community scan included things like census information and demographics and what we needed to learn about our community. We talked and learned about community or library trends that are occurring nationally, uh, the issue that I mentioned where it's about access and not ownership, uh, the use of space, flexibility, maker spaces, things that are occurring in libraries across the country. We reviewed our mission, vision, and value statement, which I will also review as part of this presentation. We did lots and lots of surveys in-house and online. We uh, conducted focus groups with the business community, senior citizens, educators, teens, government officials, including yourselves the general public, members of the staff, and friends of the library. So we had a lot of information that we gathered from those focus groups. And then we created strategic priorities. Uh, from those priorities, we created a work plan. And that work plan is reviewed constantly. We're always updating it, adding, tweaking, massaging, crossing things out because they make no sense anymore. And then we are uh, looking at the updating process. And that's when we'll, um, we'll have Jim come up in just a moment. But I want to literally read out our three major statements because I think they're important and because I want members of the public to know what they are if they can't read the screen. So for our mission, the mission of the Scarborough Public Library is to provide access to a broad and deep collection and high quality services that promote lifelong learning in a welcoming community-centered facility. Our vision statement is that the library will be an innovative leader in implementing a variety of strategies to bring knowledge and promote learning opportunities for people of all ages. And our values, the library will be a vibrant, spirited library that demands outstanding performance in all areas. We will assist a broad population to access knowledge and information through diverse formats for both formal and independent education. We will maintain a professional and highly skilled staff to assist with access to information and services. We will use resources judiciously to provide a stimulating and welcoming atmosphere and a variety of programs and spaces that serve as an anchor for the community. We will serve as a proactive and courageous leader in the library community, keeping abreast of the latest technology while honoring and maintaining tradition. We will engage and respectfully consult with community members to ensure that a broad population has a positive experience. Our strategic priorities are four. We could do so much more, but we needed to focus. So we focused into four priorities, much as you as a town council have four goals for the year. So our four are provide access to high quality services and collections, to promote lifelong learning, to engage the community in developing and promoting resources and partnership opportunities, and to provide a versatile, welcoming, and safe place that serves as an anchor for the community. So we um, have a recent survey that Jim Cupel will review right now, and this is a, an opportunity for us to check back in with the community on some of the <coughs> questions that we had for them in our early surveys. So, Jim. Making sure I've got the... Yes, it's a good question to ask you. So some of you, um, I'm Jim Cupel, I'm a, a new trustee to the library and uh, also a professional researcher and strategist and, uh, 
you know, as a, a newbie, you know, they, they pressed me right into action. So uh, you may have seen um, parts of this in the, the, the leader this last uh, week. And so I'm, I'm going to try not to bore you too much. But uh, you can see the overview. Part of the purpose here was really to update the uh, update the strategic planning information that we had and to provide community with a, an opportunity to tell us what they're thinking and how they're thinking if it's different from what it was. And so it was really uh, an online, what we would call a convenience sample, so it's you know not, not a clinical trial or anything like that, but it, it was in three, three sections which were general usage and awareness opinions and ideas and then demographics and we'll show you a little bit of that. They, they consistent with the analysis period we did it in early February which was about the last time they did it prior so that, that worked out pretty well and uh, we ended up with uh, 606 completed surveys out of 741 that were started which is pretty good uh, pretty good results and the last bullet there you can see on the screen is you know, this, this really is a, a, a survey of folks that are supporters and engaged folks. 39% uh, use the library once a week, 30, an additional 39 use it at least once a month. So, you know, 80% use it once a month or more or less, which is a pretty good, uh, pretty good group. So, um, give you a sense of the age. So, uh, you know, the, the younger people, didn't get engaged as much, but it also mirrors the list that the library uses and has used over the years. So you can see that the, the red bar, the highest 30% is 65 to 74. They have more time to read. I've discovered this with friends of mine. So it, it doesn't make any, uh, it, it makes sense to me. Uh, the, the other piece in terms of usage, we just talked about that. This is uh, this is basically the, the, the top of it, and there are a few that that uh, never use the library, and you know, so we've got uh, we've got some of that in here, and, and a few aren't sure. <coughs> so um, I felt like that last week. I'm really not sure. So um, if the snow continues, we'll all feel that way. Uh, so the next slide is is um, back to a little bit of what Nancy was saying in terms of moving from connections, of collections to connections, and, and we'll get you this deck, we won't read it in, in great detail, but we, we basically asked folks, you know, are you familiar with some of these services and, and tell us about that. So it, the highest bar that you can see there, that green one, uh, third from the left, 95% said they were somewhat or very familiar with access to the state interlibrary loan. That's what we affectionately call Minerva. And, and you know, it's, it's uh, average on a three-point scale is 2.7. The, uh, the one that you see in the middle is the lowest, which um, we'll just test this right now. How many of you know that the library does exam proctoring? You, you don't count. You're on the I know. board. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe nobody else raised their hand on the board. <laughs> well, I'm assuming some of them know, um, or you know, or they might be in that not sure category. Who knows? But, but the bottom line is, the library does a whole bunch of things and is connected in a whole bunch of different ways with the community. And this list gives you an idea. But a lot of these things, you know, meeting rooms, wireless access programs for teens. Uh, you know, ebooks, but things like that. Very few of uh, those ideas and services are actual physical objects. There are some, obviously, but so I'll just point out the you know when you break it down, Minerva, 75% said they're very familiar with that, 21% somewhat familiar, and over to that exam proctoring, 89% said not at all, they hadn't even heard of it. Mm -hmm. So you know, they don't. We're, we're representative in this group. Um, so then we asked a series of questions that really had to do with agree, disagree, and they weren't highly political questions. They were really trying to get people <coughs> to give us a sense of you know, how they, they viewed the library and the community. And so uh, there were four or five of them. They're not all uh, portrayed here, but uh, some to give you a sense of it. So 
One of them uh, was the question, do you agree, disagree, uh, how, how much do you agree or disagree with the, the statement, the library has resources for just about everyone. Well, you know, 61% completely agree and another 24% mostly agree. So that's, that's pretty, well, pretty well supported and there's 1% that completely uh, disagrees. Um, so, uh, and then uh, library has a convenient location. Now, you know, understandably, these are people who've been to the library, so they know where it is and they know it's convenient. But uh, my guess is that if we get it a statistically uh, significant sample of the town, we get probably pretty similar results. The library is in a great location. It's central to the town, uh, and 83% of the users agree that it is. Uh, and then we also have these little uh, little libraries around the, the community in different the neighborhoods, and you know they they get built uh, um, as local people sort of they're basically boxes in front of your yard, but you can you, know, you can check out books there. So we've got a bunch of those around. Uh, the library needs more space to accommodate the needs of different groups within the town. Now this as a surveyor. I look at a, uh, a spectrum like this and I say, oh, look at that big neutral. So these are folks that, you know, they're really not sure about this, and, and, uh, but you've got a, a good slug of folks that are mostly agree, completely agree, but you can see 14% are not sure and 28% are neutral. And uh, so those are folks that, you know, they don't know if they need more time, you know, more space to accommodate the groups, but uh, they did consider it. Uh, the next, the next question, it's important to, uh, to think of the library as a public space for the community that anyone can use for free. Again, 77% uh, completely agree, another 14% uh, mostly agree, and you can see how it trails off there. The library is an essential service for a growing town like Scarborough. Again, very strong agree, disagree. Uh, and <laughs> in general, residents are satisfied or extremely satisfied with the Scarborough Public Library. And I would take this moment just to uh, give accolades to, to Nancy, Catherine, and Celeste who are here from the library because, you know, this is a new board for me and it's just been wonderful. It really has. It's a, it's a very well run. And so then, um, the last thing we did is we, we did open-ended questions, and that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, there are 330 of these comments, like, you're doing a great job, or we need more of this. And, you know, I, I scanned through them. I think Nancy memorized them, probably, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, there, there were a few things that, that came up. Um, but as we mentioned in the, in the article in the paper, you know, some of the things that came up more consistently were things about, um, you know, uh, we need more space. We need longer summer hours when residents are in, uh, summer residents are in town, those kinds of things. So, but you can see the words that came up, you know, most frequently in this little uh, wordle. And then, um, so, and that's kind of it. I don't know. We're going to save questions for later. So. Would you like a few questions now? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah I, I, have, I have a question. Um, what was your methodology in your survey? In other words, what was the population you were sampling from? Was it uh, was it some library people? Was it community at large? Was it online? Was it you phone called? Was it? You know, like I said at the beginning, I think that it's really a convenient sample. The library's got a list of about 5,000 people that have, are either library card holders, okay. they participate in groups. Uh, at the polls this, uh, this last year, we asked people, you know, you want to want to answer a survey, so we got their information. So, yeah, it, you know, and as you saw from the early things, you know, 80% of these people have been in the library at least once a, a month. So my guess is that most of these are, you know, uh, core supporters. Okay. And the reason I ask that for yeah. obvious reasons is, you know, are you sampling people who are already familiar with the library? 
Or are you sampling the population in general, many of whom may or may not use the library? I'm just a curious question. Yeah, no, it's, a great qu it's an excellent question. So this is part of like a three or four step process that the, the trustees are doing. They decided, you know, let's, let's start out there first and like with the wordle here, find out what the issues are mm -hmm. and then begin to sort of surface those. The next, the next layer of that is uh, to do some what we would call intercept surveys. Right. So next week at Pat's Pizza, you know, they're doing a uh, you know a library donation thing. We'll have you know questionnaires and things for people to fill out. Um, later in the year, we'll do some focus groups, mm -hmm. as you noticed in the last. So we'll, you know, get people in the in to have the conversation, and then probably at some later point, whether or not it's this year or early next, we'll probably do a quantitative study mm -hmm. with a randomized sample. Mm -hmm. But then you start talking, you know, some, some good money. So yeah, um, that's why I asked. Yeah, no, <laughs> but no, it's a great it's yeah. A, yeah it's a great question. Thank you very okay. much. Other questions, comments? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking that question. When we did our, uh, in 2006, some of you may recall the library had a, uh, a referendum and it was defeated. And at that time, we did a significant study. And it was a professional survey with critical mm -hmm. insights. And we have tried to keep some of those questions going forward right. so that we have some comparisons over time. Uh, so we have talked about at what point we go back for that level of general surveying, but uh, we're not there yet, so we've been using the tools that are available to us and in-house. So, thank you for asking. So, we are currently working through our work plan, and we have the four priorities that I mentioned to you earlier. Each of the sections of the work plan has objectives and strategies, and within each of those we have a timeline, who's responsible for making sure it gets done, what kind of resources we need to have uh, to make it possible, what kinds of partners we might want, want to draw in from the community, and then how do we ultimately measure that it's been done? What's the outcome measurement? It's a working document. Uh, my copy has pencil and pen and scratches all over it. Uh, it's, it truly is a, a work. Uh, so that is what we've been using to go through our years and say, what have we accomplished? Are we on track? Is there a project here that we need to be putting more attention to? We've had some significant successes, and those are the types of things I'm going to share with you right now. One of the things that we're really proud of is that we in, uh, instigated, in quotes, instigated, a common borrowing agreement with neighboring libraries. You are currently able to go to Westbrook, Gorham, Cape Elizabeth, and South Portland libraries with your Scarborough Public Library card and check out materials from those libraries. That's something that we created as an initiative. The other libraries were very interested in it and very happy to join in. And we have had such, such success, it hasn't even been a year yet, that we have additional libraries from the region uh, knocking on our door saying, can we come too? We expect that this has been so successful and easy to do because we're all members of Minerva, our shared borrowing system, that we may be the first wave of a regional opportunity here. And it might ultimately result in a statewide borrower's card. So Scarborough leads the way once again. Uh, we have been spending a number of, um, we have been putting a lot of emphasis into our electronic book and downloadable titles. Uh, both through what we offer in Scarborough and purchase in Scarborough or get licenses to in Scarborough and what the state offers through the, the uh, statewide system for downloadables. And the statistic in fine print there is that in uh, the last fiscal year, we had 12,940 items downloaded. So that's a pretty significant um, amount of items for uh, fairly recent service. We have seen a comparable decline in print material circulation, so there's no surprise there. We are currently, just within the last month, um, thanks to Catherine Morrison's hard work and research, we are now offering Flipster, which is an electronic online magazine service. We have 44 mm -hmm. titles available. Yes, there are back issues. Uh, so we are very excited about that. I've had a chance to play with it, and it's, it's working great on various devices. So we hope you'll take advantage of Flipster. 
uh, to let us know that it, it's, uh, the, it's what you want. We heard from the surveys over time that people were looking for this kind of a service, so we're happy to be able to offer it finally. We've also improved onboarding, and that's our term for when somebody comes in and wants to use a computer, how many hoops do they have to jump through, or passwords do they have to enter, or buttons do they have to click to get through our security or onto our network? Not literally our network, but our, our system. Um, we've changed how that happens. It's a very uh, easy process, and we have installed some uh, coin op uh, machines on our printers, so people have a lot more privacy. They don't have to come to a staff member at a printer and say, please give me a print. <coughs> they can grab their printouts from the, the coin op. So that whole process of how public printing occurs has been uh, significantly improved. We also now have the capability of printing from your wireless device, which is a, a new feature as well. And we've also increased our number of hotspots in the building, so it's a lot better reception. And as some of you know, you can also receive the wireless signal out in the parking lot. Uh, so you will often see people parked out there with glowing um, cabs and either trucks, long distance truckers, or we actually have had people get degrees. We had during the, the big power outage, we had a woman who was teaching a class from our parking lot, from our wireless <laughs> system. So that wireless in the parking lot is a big part of our service. And you, meant, you know, I mentioned you, we can't do standard gate counts anymore. That's kind of an example. <laughs> but we had 12,163 uses of our public computers. And I want to make sure that that's acknowledged because we tend to think of Scarborough as a highly wired, highly educated <coughs> uh, community that, where everybody has a computer or more devices at home. And it's not entirely true that there isn't a need for this. <coughs> we often will see people using our public computers who need to fill in a job application online. Mm -hmm. This is a skill that many people do not have. Mm -hmm. And our staff is extremely patient in walking them through the steps for how that happens. And they can come back and get the follow-up for their job application at our library. So we're really, we've, we've uh, increased the number of stations that are available. Again, counter to what we might think about for Scarborough needs. Yes, there's a demographic there as well, not only in terms of um, economic capabilities, but age. Uh, many people who are of our older generation have not been able to keep up with technological changes. So we are, we are there holding their hand whenever it's helpful. And there were 21,000 plus um, Wi-Fi logins, which is pretty remarkable as well. We do uh, cut out if your phone is connected. We don't. And you might have three devices with you when you walk in your door, and they might all be hitting our wireless. We do try to reduce that number so it's a, a more legitimate number. Otherwise, we'd be in the 50,000s. Yeah. So the, the um, library offers, as I mentioned, access. We do it through Minerva, which is our online catalog. In the background, we also have MainCat, which uh, gives us access to some of the academic collections. And then ultimately, we have an interlibrary loan system that will draw materials from the world. And WorldCat is the, the name of that larger catalog. And how does it happen? Person by person, hand to hand. <laughs> it's a very um, specific task that we do every day by the hundreds. We will go to the shelf, pull a book off for the request that we've received, put it in a canvas bag with a zipper, zip it up, put an address label on it, put it in one of these blue totes, a truck, from our courier company comes every day, five days a week, hauls these totes off to the sorting center. The sorting center distributes them out to the whole state. So you might have a request that you've asked for from Machias. Theoretically, you should have it within two days. Uh, it's a pretty exciting uh, pros process. And uh, last year, we had 39,000 mm -hmm. items that we transferred one way or the other. The second priority is to promote lifelong learning. And we are a uh, supporter of the American Library Association, Every Child Ready to Read, which is a protocol for improving literacy skills for the very youngest child. We are also a member of Family Place Libraries, which is a, an organization that we apply to. There are standards that you have to meet. And we provide workshops and uh, services based on a standard from the Family Place Library that will help caregivers and parents learn to use skills, even how to play with toys, that will be uh, the best uh, result for their child. 
So we do those workshops on a regular schedule. We have bedtime math skills, which will just add little math uh, stories or activities to our story times, or we give you little tips for taking home for your children. And we have summer reading promotions with the school department now, which are unlike anything we've ever seen. We have so much wonderful cooperation with the school department and their librarians and the literacy staff. And last year, we registered 772 kids for our summer wow. reading program. We, as the library staff, go to the schools and cheerlead about what's going to happen with the summer reading. But what's equally important is that the school staff and the library staff work together to be sure what we're promoting is helpful, that it supports the curriculum, that it's age appropriate, that when we put reading lists together or the school puts reading lists together, the library actually owns the books or at least can get access to the books. So it's a really wonderful relationship and we're so pleased that it's been working out so well. We also have regular workshops which Catherine is responsible for on digital resources. We do have a lot of digital resources, so it's important for us to be sure that senior citizens know how to operate them. And I will say senior citizens because they're the more typical audience, but they are not the only audience that we train. And Catherine and her staff actually will go to some of our senior facilities, uh, so they'll do one-on-one -on -one tutorials as well as group tutorials with the folks that are interested. So it's a big part of what we do. It's important for us to, when we add a new service, it's important for us to be sure that our community can use it. So that's part of what we think about when we add something to our service. We also have the software or the, the service transparent language. So if you'd like to learn Mandarin or something more esoteric than that, transparent language has a lot of languages. It's also available for people who are learning English. So it goes both ways. Uh, it is available through our website, and you're welcome to use that program. We also have lynda.com, which many of you know offers workshops, very high quality workshops for people, particularly with um, electronic, software, um, business type skills that they want to brush up on. And you can actually get a certificate of completion after you've completed the series of workshops. This is a subscription that the individual homeowner typically would have to pay for, but the library pays for a group subscription. So it's free to you, uh, Scarborough only. Uh, free to you to use, and uh, the certificate of completion is often seen on LinkedIn accounts or people's resumes. It's, uh, it, it's enough quality to the presentations that it has value in that respect as well. So here are some examples of our Family Place Library. Multiple age caregivers, as you might note, and the children are learning how to use toys appropriately. We have counselors of some type at each of our workshops. So it might be a yoga instructor, it might be a pediatrician, it might be a pediatric dentist, um, a movement specialist, a psychologist, somebody with a special um, a specialty in ch early childhood development of some sort. They will wander around the room during these play days to just talk to folks, answer questions, help parents and caregivers feel more comfortable about engaging their child in appropriate ways that will help with literacy. We have a summer reading program, Community Partners Program, where we bring in members of our community to read stories and participate in the activities. So examples here are our fire department. The center is our uh, music pet petting zoo. We have professional musicians come in and bring their instruments. And they actually, the kids actually were able to play something. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but they play something at the end. And then Public Works is um, an example here as well. We did have a wonderful picture of our police chief doing yoga with the kids, but he got rasped so badly when it appeared on our Facebook page that I <laughs> So that does not appear. But we do have uh, a variety of members um, of our town staff that do come. And uh, we're, we're reaching out for others in our community. We are expecting a, a representative from Amtrak to join us. We have a conductor signed up for this coming summer. So there'll be a lot more opportunities. But um, everybody loves um, having the, the community members participate. It's been a lot of fun. This is our teen advisory board at the end of a lock-in. We have a large group of kids um, learning leadership skills as well as just having a great time in the library and having a good sense of what the library can be for them. This is the, the participants as well as the teen advisory board in the lock-in, at the end of the lock-in. We have two to three lock-ins a, uh, a year. Friday night, we'll close the door, teens only, uh, with a few library staff just to keep control. But uh, the kids plan the programs, they operate the programs, they manage the cleanup, 
and they do a phenomenal job. The kids in this picture that are in black aprons, the Teen Advisory Board black apron is a real badge of honor. Uh, we had to buy more because the Teen Advisory Board is growing. Uh, but it's a wonderful group of kids. We're so proud to have them with a really positive image of what <coughs> young teens can do in our community and for their peers to have such fun at the same time and see the leadership that's developing is fun for us as well. We have intergenerational opportunities within our programming and uh, the one picture in the center here is an example of our knitting group. One of the more experienced knitters is teaching a young person. I believe he's learning how to cast on in that picture. But. Uh, and then on either side here, you've got the library staff person helping a senior, ironically, with headphones on, learning a uh, computer skill. And on the right-hand <laughs> side is a very young person with headphones on, learning a computer skill. The young person is uh, seated at our uh, early literacy station. It's a pre-packaged uh, computer with a lot of software packages that are interactive. So that's a touch screen. There's a tiny little mouse that's the right size for a child. The keyboard is set with different colors so the kids can point out numbers and, and vowels and that sort of thing. And it's a, um, a significant investment that we are able to make because Saco and Bitterman Savings sponsors the uh, stations for us. This is the second generation that we've received grant money for, so we're really pleased to be able to offer this. And it is interactive, so this is not a passive computer sit-down. This is not babysitting. The kids are actually learning on the stations, which is really important for us. So priority three is engage the community in developing and promoting resources and partnership opportunities. And some of the things that we're pointing out as real successes for us, the number of volunteers that we're using at the library. You may have read something in the paper recently about how difficult it is for court-ordered community service to be um, mm. engaged because so many organizations do not want those volunteers any longer. We try as much as possible to help volunteers <laughs> do their service. It's, it's generally a service to us as well, but not always. And I think that's important when you, uh, to recognize when you're working with volunteers. Uh, when you give a volunteer a good experience, you need to give them supervision. You need to give them something of value to do. You need to give them the resources to do their job appropriately. And it means we have to have something that's appropriate for them to do in a setting that um, you need to remind yourself. The library has confidential information, and some of the things we do should be confidential. So it has to be a pretty discreet kind of service that they're offering. But we do a really good job of that. We had engaged 54 volunteers last year for a 1,500 hours, and if you figure that at $9 an hour, that's a $13,000 contribution to the library thanks to volunteer service. Uh, those volunteers, again, might come from court-appointed community service. They might come from a school service project that they're required to do, and that, that can be all ages. Sometimes we're working with younger children than we typically would accept. Um, Habitat for Humanity is a wonderful example of great mm -hmm. volunteers that we're using or we're giving opportunities to. Uh, so we also have just those great people who want to get back to their community, senior citizens among them. Uh, we have rebranded our uh, home delivery service as one of our initiatives, and the two <coughs> canvas bags on the table are examples of the rebranding. We, are, we used to call them outreach. Uh, they're now called home delivery. Two size bags. We were able to buy the bags and the materials for them thanks to two grants. One was from Friends of Maine Libraries through the sponsorship of our own Friends of Libraries, and also uh, Scarborough Terrace gives an annual volunteer recognition award to an organization. So with those two packaged together, we were able to buy two size bags. The bags actually double up. We have uh, two bags for every delivery we make. So we drop one bag off with materials in it and take the other full one back with us. So there's always a container for folks to have in their home that's labeled and they know where to put the library books, which is surprisingly important because family members may inadvertently remove something and not get it back to us. Uh, so those bags are an, an important uh, part of our rebranding effort. We also have the kindness project, civility and discussion, civility discussion, the, the food security conversation that occurred. So we are just, we are an opportunity to build partnerships, but we are also happy to host and convene those conversations. We, I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of multi-generational computer activities, but we also have activities such as coloring 
and drawing and knitting and French conversation. We have the little free libraries, which Jim alluded to, which are in parks and in businesses and in neighborhoods. And Emily Reed is the, the guru behind our little free library. She's our, our mega um, steward. <laughs> um, and we are leveraging partnerships for programming, which is the only way we can do it. Those of you who, who have followed the budget for years have heard me say, we have only $1,000 for programming, and yet we reached 12,824 people last year with 550 programs. That was only possible because we worked with others. And um, others are delighted to work with us as well. So ongoing programs, we have book discussions, we have the movie matinee. Our meeting room only seats 50, so we've now had to show twice. We always have an encore presentation for our movie matinee. Uh, we have, again, the, mit the knitting, sketching, coloring groups that community members facilitate for us. Let's Talk America, thanks to Sam Kelly. Um, he's been facilitating that uh, current events conversation for many, many years for us. The French Conversation and the Teen Writers Groups are also facilitated by community support. And these are just um, some examples of other organizations that we've worked with. Historical Society is starting to meet at the library now. You will um, probably know that the AARP tax assistant occurs at the library. So here's June Cassidy, the person who won the award for Scarborough Terrace, but one of our very dedicated volunteers who's a whiz at mending books. And that is a very detailed uh, task that we're thrilled she's able to do for us. And then our final priority is to provide a versatile, welcoming, and safe place that serves as an anchor for the community. Meeting space, as you know. 50 meetings last year outside of library <coughs> programs for 145 hours of meeting space. It's really difficult for ourselves to be able to book a room because it's so busy. We provide shelter space, as you will know from our big storm. Uh, for weather emergencies, we will open early, stay open late. We have an air conditioner, so in heat emergencies or, or winter emergencies, we are prepared to be flexible in terms of what the community needs for space outside of the official um, shelter. And we are members of the, the resiliency team. We are members of Southern Maine Community Organizations Active in Disaster, which is Southern Maine Co-Edge for short. We will help coordinate volunteers that might uh, show up after a major emergency. We are also a NOAA Weather Ready Nation Ambassador, which gives us an opportunity to share information about weather phenomena with our community. Uh, we are demonstration sites for things that you might not realize. Our front lawn with the wonderful dandelions that are featured on our library card, that's a pesticide-free lawn and has been since its inception. We are, uh, as you know, installing rooftop solar and our EVPV. Uh, again, examples of how we want to provide information and demonstrations to the community. And we are, um, the last point is just that we are trying to gather information about the, the library and how the community uses us and understand better what we want to measure for outcomes. Again, not the gate count anymore. We want to understand what is a successful visit to the library. So I'm going to start racing a little bit because I know our time is uh, coming to an end here. This is just me at, at Summerfest, but it's an example of our role in the community with public education on community preparedness. We have brochures available at the library all the time for people to pick up so that they can prepare their own uh, evacuation kit. And uh, the purple vest that I'm wearing in that picture represents the Southern Maine Co-Ed membership. During the power outage, we were a refuge for people who needed to plug in or power up. Uh, we had people conducting business the full week there. Uh, the pictures are showing people sitting on the floor in every chair. We brought in extra power strips. We were full. This is our installation that's underway right now. We've just completed all of the solar panel installation on the roof. And the uh, structure that you see there was built by Public Works with great pride. And it is now installed uh, on the pad. And that is going to be where we have four solar panels that will support the electric vehicle uh, charger. The EVPV stands for Electric Vehicle Photovoltaic. But it's a whole lot more fun to say EVPV. <laughs> so that's what we're going with. We will be having a dedication of both uh, projects on Earth Day, Sunday, April 22nd, with a dedication at 1 PM. Uh, the activities will run from noon until 3. We'll be uh, hosting a lot of organizations and activities that are Earth-related, Earth-friendly. 
and um, we hope we're going to be able to have things plug in at that point. We've also received commitments from some electric vehicle uh, car dealers who will be bringing examples of their vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we're excited, and I hope you'll join us on Sunday, April 22nd, particularly at 1 o'clock for the ribbon cutting. So our service to the community, we believe, is responsive. We have meeting space. We are conveners of, of conversations. We are trusted. We are neutral. We're accessible and we have resources or can create resources for folks. And our future. Um, it's not about collection, you might have heard me mention. It's about access. And spaces for people and activities is going to be the most important thing that we're going to be looking at. What we do know from our surveys and national studies is that we need spaces that are flexible, that provide separation from activity and sound levels, so if you've got a two-year-old who's having a bad day and a person who's trying to do quiet study, we have an appropriate space for both of those folks. Or we have a group of uh, people who are having a conversation over a hot topic in the newspaper and ten teens who have just walked in after school. We want to be sure everybody has their home and space and, and are comfortable. The spaces are going to need to be to accommodate large and small groups. They need to be spaces that are neat and tidy, as well as some where people can be constructed, whether that's maker spaces or crafts or whatever the case may be. We're going to need to have different kinds of toleration within those spaces. We want to make sure that we are going to be facilitating intergenerational socialization. So we don't want to separate people to the point where they can't see each other and interact. We want to have that social opportunity, and the library is a perfect place for that to occur. The community living room is a, is a conversation that perhaps we want to have. Um, that's a term that's used in many libraries. Think about the library as a community living room. Uh, amenities, uh, we've heard from people in our surveys that they want outside seating. They'd like a cafe. We do currently allow covered coffee, so for folks to bring the coffee in, that's fine. Some folks have said, where's the fireplace? And yes, pool did come up in our last survey from more than one person. So I just want to be fair and mention that. So we are listening. We are in the listening mode right now. We are within the next year to two years going to be working hard on planning for an expansion project. Communication, as all of I don't have to tell you all how important communication is. Communication is going to be so vital for us. So we'll be thinking of every strategy we can to work on communication and listening. And then we are going to have to um, undertake a major fundraising campaign as well. That's our expectation and our commitment, and that comes with additional um, planning and surveying. So that will be um, our last opportunity to really reach into the community and, and make everybody a part of our operation. So I'm going to stop there. How's that? <laughs> so I do have materials to pass out. Um, Emily, maybe you could just start passing them around. And I, um, I'm open to any questions you might have in the few moments that we have. Thank you, Nancy. Town Council members, uh, questions? Do you do a delivery of uh, library materials to uh, people who are perhaps shut in or restricted? That's the, uh, the That's home delivery program that we that, that, yeah. the bags are. So you actually yeah. deliver them we actually deliver. to We have to their volunteers house. that are pre-screened um, and we use the same volunteers for the delivery so that they develop a relationship with the person that they're delivering to. So having that person step in and uh, um, make sure that they know the person coming to their door for security is important to us. That's great. Uh, I know that uh, uh, you indicated that Minerva is very popular, very well known. Uh, do you, uh, I expect that people who are not very adept at computers are the ones who are missing out on it, and yet these are oftentimes older people, mm -hmm. uh, people who just, the electronic age has passed them by. Uh, so I was wondering if, uh, do you have, have you ever thought of a, uh, uh, a video that could be posted to provide simple instruction, allow people to go back and forth and learn how to do it. I know I years ago, Catherine showed me how to do it, and I was forever grateful because I use it all the time. We have had videos that the state has produced in the past, and I don't know if they're updated now. We've, we've had such change in the software over time that I, I suspect that it's not been updated. Not a bad idea. We do have tip sheets uh, available, and we always have what's known as staff. 
<laughs> yeah, the best way is always the Person. have somebody right Person. there and show you, uh, and then make you do it a few times before you leave the building. It's a great I, opportunity. Some for me the, to the people that. you're missing, I expect, yeah. are people who are not making it into the building, mm -hmm. uh, and so some sort of outreach might be uh, appropriate. Great suggestion. Uh, Thank you. I know that we have gone through uh, some Planet Palooza and whatnot, sort of looking at the future of Scarborough. And one of the things that received a lot of support and attention was community center. And because I think the library and the things that you're identifying here are central to the success of any community. Mm -hmm. It would seem to me that you should be in that discussion whenever it starts. And I would like to be able to invite you to be a participant in that because I could see the library playing a very important role in the kinds of space that you're talking about, which would also exist in a community right. center. I think, I think it's important to note that they offer very different functions, but there's definitely an overlap when you're talking about service and space and community needs. Um, ironically, uh, when Andrew Carnegie created his early libraries, they did have recreation spaces in them, boxing yeah. rings, swimming pool, um, because health, mind, body right. connection was important to him. So it's, um, it seems innovative, but in fact it's really old. <laughs> <laughs> no, and the, the socialization space, uh, the computer, uh, Wi-Fi space, mm -hmm. uh, different sizes of space. Uh, I see a community center as uh, serving seniors, uh, I don't see it as just a swimming pool and a gymnasium mm -hmm. and a running track. I think it's much broader than that. And the leadership which your board and you have brought to the library, to the community, I think should play an important role in that. That would be very valuable. We look forward to it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Will? Yeah. <clears throat> What, what would you say is the biggest shortcoming of the existing space? Is it just that you don't have enough of it, or is there something in particular that is? Uh, I would say two things. One, we don't have enough of it, and we, it's open floor plan, so we don't have separation of noises. So you've got um, after school, if you come in at 3 o'clock, it's chaos. But it might also be chaos after our senior movie. Hmm. Uh, it might also be chaos after story time. Uh, we don't have that noise separation, the barriers. We have inappropriate space and seating for new technology. We've, we've really done incredible work in figuring out how to seat somebody at a station that was never designed to be what it is. We have portable labs. Uh, some of you, uh, hopefully rarely, but some of you may have actually witnessed our transaction of the, or transformation of the meeting room into a computer lab. We have um, carts in the back room that we've retrofitted with hard drives on them. We have to literally wheel them out of the back staff room, through the library, into the meeting room every time we have a um, computer program, which some cycles is, is weekly and sometimes more than once a week. So we're trucking 10 tables through the building with computer equipment on them, hoping that we can get through without snagging anybody. Uh, so the appropriate kinds of space. And then numbers, I mean, the, the movies, the size of the space. The, the meeting room space of 50 is completely inadequate for a community of our size now. So the kinds of spaces, meeting space, and that I mean small group meeting <coughs> space, uh, collegial space, where would you get together to tutor a student in the library? We don't have space for that, so you're in the middle of everything that's going on, often at the busiest time of day after school. So those kinds of spaces that are more appropriate. Can I ask a follow-up? Well, completely unrelated. But what are the numbers that you do see after school? And, and what are the ages? Oh. Ages, are, it's usually middle school. We rarely see high schoolers. And it can be, depending on what the sports activities and whether there's a dance after school, um, 50 to 60 kids might sweep in. Um, some of those we may have to split off and ask them to move on. I will say that the basketball courts across the road are a big help. We do check out basketballs and other athletic equipment to give kids something to do. Um, that isn't um, <laughs> inappropriate for the library. Um, but we do have occasional behavior problems. But I want to stress that most of the kids, as you saw with the teen advisory kids, most of the kids that come in the library are great. Um, it, the behavior tends to change when they're with friends. Uh, so if we can separate them, they're much friendlier. 
And is it generally the same group of kids that you see in day and down? Yeah. There are some kids that we really are the support team for. Uh, there, there are kids that really rely on the library for safety and comfort. and. Um, yeah, the term keys is, and that's the term we typically use, but it's a lot more complex than that. Um, some kids just come over and hang out with their friends, and the word hang out is like something like we're thinking of homework or working on group projects or something that's a little productive. But we are a hangout as well, and it's, uh, it's part of what teenagers do. That's part of what they're doing is their development, is learning how to be a member of society outside of the school building. So we, we try to help them do some for that. Thank you, for, for, Thank you for providing this wonderful presentation, and we look forward to you working forward and keeping in touch with us. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Momentarily adjourned, and we'll immediately go into the beginning of the meeting. <laughs>